everybody, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today is going to be a little bit more of a lesson than a tutorial. You're going to get lots of me and not so much um, tutorials on how to do things and where to go and where to click. Um, but we're going to talk about a theory in genealogy that might be a little bit more advanced for some of you. Um, but it's something that might save you a lot of headache down the road. So what we're talking about today is not just proving relationships between generations, but also working to disprove those relationships. Um, it's a little bit of a unique approach to genealogy, but as I said, it will save you a lot of heartache later on down the road. So I'll be flipping back and forth between the PowerPoint and myself so that you can um, maybe catch the vision. I tend to talk with my hands a lot and, and um, we'll see how it goes from here, okay? So, the very first thing that you're going to want to do um, when you approach your genealogy this way is to collect all possible matches for the ancestor that you're looking for. So let me just give you an example of what I mean by that. If you have an ancestor, and we'll use a really common name um, because that's where it most often happens, although it does happen otherwise as well. If you have a really common name like John Smith and he's living in Tennessee in 1807. He, you find a 1850 census record for him, you find an 1860 census record for him, he's listed with other family members that you know, so you know that this is your guy. But you're trying to go back to now the 1840 census, where it only lists head of household. One of the things that we see that new genealogists often do is that they jump directly to, oh, I found a John Smith who is about the right age and he's living in about the right place. And that's great, but how do you know that's your guy? So one of the things that I recommend is that you collect all possible matches. Search for every John Smith who's about the right age, living in about the right place. Don't just jump to the first one that you find. Once you collect all those possible matches, then I recommend that you spend as much time and energy as you can trying to disprove those connections as much as you do trying to prove those connections. Now, that seems a little bit ambiguous, so here's how I'm going to explain that, okay? Um, I have a great, great, great grandmother. I think that's right. And she um, was, I have her marriage record. I have information about her in later censuses with other family members, so I know I have the right person. I also knew her maiden name because of her marriage record. What I was looking for was to find her as a child in the 1880 census with her parents. And I didn't know who her parents were. I did know the county in Ohio where she was born. I also knew about how old she should be, okay? And, and I didn't have an exact birth date, right? I had an age off her marriage certificate. I had an age off the 1900, 1910, 1920, and 1930 censuses. And those ages were all within about three years of each other. So I didn't have an exact birth date, but I had an approximate age. So I went to the 1880 census. I put in what I know about her name, her approximate age, and where I thought she should be living, which really was the whole state of Ohio, because she was married in one county, she lived in at least two other counties before moving to Louisiana. So with that information, I was able to pull up three possible matches, okay? One of those matches was um, a servant girl living in somebody else's home, so no other family members. One of those matches was a girl who was living with her parents and her siblings. And one of those matches was a girl who was living with a sister and her grandparents and an aunt. Okay, so now I've collected three possible matches for who might be my great grandmother and her family. So if my objective then is to spend as much time and energy trying to disprove these these people are mine, as I do trying to prove that one of these women is mine. It's Again, it's a little bit of a shift in the way that you approach it, but you sometimes come up with quicker results. So here's how I did that. I, I passed over the servant girl for the time being but, because I wanted to focus on the other two girls. I started with the girl who was living with her parents. Now, she was living with her parents and some of her siblings. So what I did was I took those parents and I traced them down through records until they died. And what I was looking for was a death record 
um, particularly an obituary that listed their daughter and what her married name might be. Didn't find it, okay? So then I took all of the siblings in that family and I traced each of them down to their death. And in one of their obituaries in 1953, I found a reference to this sister of theirs with a maiden name or with a married name that was different than the married name that my grandmother had. So I knew then that that particular girl in that particular home with that family was not my great grandmother. So then I moved on to the girl who was living with her grandparents and her sister and her aunt. And I went through the same process. I traced those grandparents, no record. I traced that aunt, couldn't find any reference to her. I traced the sister, I actually lost the sister. No clue what happened to her after that census. Wasn't able to find a marriage record or a death record. Um, and so here I was stuck with a possibility. It could be her, but I can't prove it. I also can't disprove it. So then I went to that servant girl and I tried to figure out who she was, why she was living with that particular family. Oftentimes when you have servants living in household, um, households, well sometimes, they're related. And so I tried to look for ways that this person could be related to a family with an entirely different name. To do that, I had to go back to the 1870 census. So remember I was in 1880, now I'm going back to 1870. I went back to the 1870 census and did a search for this person, born about this time, in this place, and this time I only came up with two possibilities. Remember, I had three in the 1880 census, but now only two in the 1870 census. And one of those two was the girl I'd already proved was not this person. The other one was the same girl who was living with her grandparents in 1880. I know that because she was still living with her grandparents in 1870. Her grandparents, her aunt, her sister. Okay, So clearly the parents of these children, or probably the parents of these children, had passed away when they were really young and they were raised in the home of their grandparents. That was what I was supposing or that was the, the assumption that I was working under. Okay, So then where did this third girl go? Right. So I started digging through records. I actually specifically went to newspaper records for this little community. And here's what I found. I found out that the 19-year-old serving girl and the 18-year-old girl living with her grandparents were actually the same person. She had been enumerated twice in the 1880 census. So um, I found that because the family had listed in an article um, that so-and-so, the granddaughter of so-and-so, um, had been part of their family and they had actually left her some things um, when they had passed away in, in their appreciation for the help that she had given them in raising their children. So now I have two possibilities. I've already disproved one of them and I'm left with only one possibility, right? So that's kind of how that works. You spend as much time and energy after you've collected all possible matches trying to disprove something as you do trying to prove that connection. That takes me to um, our third point for the day, um, which, and, and I kind of described this, which is to trace the possible matches through time to see which ones are not yours. Which ones can you eliminate, right? If you know, for example, that your John Smith had 13 children, and you trace some of those other John Smiths down to wills or property records and discover that you know one of them only had four children or one of them had six sons and your guy only had two sons and the rest were all daughters right those are the kinds of clues that you're looking for to help you disprove the relationship between all of the possible matches and the one that you're looking at or looking for also pay attention to things like the names of siblings. Um, in the example that I used, we talked about looking for obituaries that list siblings and their, ma their married names, um, or children and their married names. That's what you're looking for. Pay attention to the families that they're living around, right? So if you know, for example, that your John Smith married a woman named Elizabeth Williams, and there are Smiths and Williams living together in a community, 
and the other John Smith has no Williams anywhere near them, you're a little bit closer to, to getting some evidence there that you're on the right track with the Smith and Williams group of people. So pay attention to siblings, pay attention to neighbors and friends. Also, pay attention to religious affiliation. Religious affiliation can help you differentiate between people that are the same name. If you know or have a record of the fact that your great-grandfather was Baptist, was always Baptist, he was born Baptist, his parents helped found this church, <laughs> um, he died Baptist, then when you come across a uh, Lutheran or a Methodist with the same name, it's, it's very possible that those are not your people. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. That leads us to our final point. And this one, um, after putting forth all the effort that you do to prove or disprove the connections with your people, I think is one of the most important. As we make our trees publicly available, particularly on Ancestry.com, where people have the ability to attach things that you've put in your tree into their tree, um, one of the things that I would recommend that you do, and one of the things that I do personally, is make notes so that others don't attach the wrong people, right? And here's how I do that. Um, I will either create a document or a smart story in my ancestry tree that says, here's the process I went through. Or it'll say something like, there are you know, three women with the same name listed in the 1880 census. I have proven that this one is not our person, right? And here's why. She grew up, she got married to a guy with an entirely different name. And I have proven that these two people are actually the same person. And here's why. I found this article in this newspaper that states this, right? Make those kinds of notes on the person in your tree so that others, when they come along, see your logic and reasoning and, and can either challenge it, which happens sometimes, and I actually love when people do that. I love when people challenge the assumptions that I've made. I love when new information comes to light that helps me look at a research problem a different way. I may have attached something before, and now you know something else, some other record has been made available that helps me disprove that connection that, I, that I've made. Let me give you one more story that kind of illustrates this example. So my mom did um, quite a bit of genealogy research in the 1970s, early 1970s, and she used those old long form um, pedigree charts and family group sheets that you stuck in that, that awkward shaped book. And she, it was all handwritten, right? It was all done by hand. And she had been trying to prove her grandfather's father. She'd been looking for him and looking for him and looking for him. And she had come across um, what she thought was a pretty good match. But she didn't feel really good about it. She didn't feel like this is for sure the right person. So what she did was she wrote it in pencil on that form. Everything else that she had proven, um, things she had sources for and documentation for, she'd written in pen. And then she'd written this, this father's name in pencil with the information about him. And then she started having children, and life got a little busier, and so she boxed some of that stuff up. A few years later, she had a cousin come to her and say, you know, you did some genealogy research. I'd love a copy of that. So she pulled those boxes out, and they went to a copy shop and made copies of these long forms that she had created. Well, here's what happened. When those forms were Xeroxed, <laughs> the pencil marks, it didn't differentiate between pen and pencil, right? It just looked like she'd written it a little bit lighter, right? And so this well-meaning cousin took that information and that information started getting propagated through the family. Um, by the time stuff started coming online um, in the 90s, that information was showing up online. And every time it would pop up, my mom would just shake her head and she'd say, I didn't prove that, I never proved that. Um, and I'm not even certain that it's the right guy. So um, when I first started here at Ancestry.com a little over eight years ago, that was one of the first lines I decided I was going to tackle. I'd been working on other stuff through my teens and, and into my 20s, and this line was the one with the record availability that I wanted to research. And so I started digging into it, and what I found was that there were actually um, four men with the name of my mom's grandfather. And each of those four men had, of course, four different parents, four different sets of parents. And the, the possibility that my mother had connected was just one of them. And so I set about systematically trying to 
prove or disprove the relationships between these people. And very, very quickly, I was able to disprove the relationship that she had had guessed about or had, had surmised that might be possible. I was able to disprove this relationship, okay? So I still hadn't figured out which father was his, but I had disproven that this was him. And so I started contacting some of those same cousins. And let me tell you, <laughs> it, it almost caused, well, it caused a lot of family drama, that's for sure, right? This, people just did not want to believe it. That's what the record said. Well, that record was really just a handwritten pedigree chart that my mom had done a couple of decades earlier. And so I actually just wrote up a one-page summary that explained why the father that they thought was the father wasn't the father. I, I talked about who this, this guy really was and who he went on to marry and have children with and who some of his children were. And then I just sent that out to all the cousins that had, had this information. Of course, then they believed me. The problem was there was all this uneasiness now because we didn't know which one it really was. And so I spent quite a bit of time trying to prove the family connection. Um, ultimately was able to do so based on a single census record where a sibling was living with um, with my mom's grandfather and his new bride. <laughs> so I was able to, to attach a sibling and once I had a sibling connected to him then I was able to prove which set of the three parents were his. So that's how it works, right? The idea is, okay, let's just review this one more time. Collect all possible matches, right? Don't just assume that the very first record you find that looks like it matches is, is really your person. Look and see if there's anybody else with the same name, living in the same places, um, or the same general area, born in about the same time, right? Um, I have family lines where, where a grandfather had a name, and he named one of his sons after himself, and then six of his sons, I'm not exaggerating, six of his sons, all named sons, after their grandfather. Not only that, two of those sons married women with the same first name, and those two grandsons that married the women with the same first name were born within six months of each other in the exact same county, right? So it's very common to have family members living in the same area with the same names, and it gets really confusing to try to sort all that out. But I have absolute faith that if you will just spend some time and energy, and again, look at, it, look at it a little differently, trying to disprove connections as much as you do trying to prove connections, you'll be successful at it. So um, make sure you trace those possible matches through time. You can go forward down to obituaries looking for siblings' names or married sisters' names. Um, you can go backwards up through time. Look at family construction, how many people are in the family, how many people should be in the family, how many people do you know about. Um, and then once you feel like you've got a really solid idea of what the connection is between these generations, make some notes. Um, make some notes so that you remember what it was that you did or didn't do, so that when you come across one of those other records, you remember, oh yeah, I already looked at this record and here's why it's not this person. But also make those notes so that others that come along that are part of your family aren't attaching the wrong person to their tree or the wrong records to the right people. Okay? Wow, like I said, that was more of, um, of a teaching thing than a tutorial thing. I hope it was useful. Um, I will be online on chat immediately following this, and so if you um, want to stick around, if you're watching this live, if you want to stick around, I'll hop on chat and answer any questions you might have about this specifically, um, or just in general, if you've got general questions. Uh, in the future, if you have questions for me, particularly um, things that you struggle with, connections you're trying to make, those kinds of things, you can email at ask at ancestry.com. We do read all of those emails. We don't answer them personally. What we do is we take those and we use them to put together presentations like this. If we see that several dozen of you are having the same kind of a problem, it, it gives us ideas for topics for presentations like this. Um, Anne does take some of those and does answer them um, individually on our Tumblr blog. There's not a specific email reply, but she will post the specific question and how she would solve that research down.